Hey guys, it's Cyrus of Chaos. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about the format that's used for almost all competitions in American college fencing and discuss a few additional major NCAA tournaments that happen every year that use a completely different format. And I decided to do this because recently we had two of those three competitions and I'm getting a lot of questions about them. So I put a little sticker on Instagram and asked you guys to submit your questions and I'm gonna do my best to answer many of them and explain the format that they are part of. So let's dive right in. A term you'll be hearing a lot in this video is NCAA or NCAAs. That stands for National Collegiate Athletic Association. Now these guys use almost all the general rules for fencing that are adopted from the USFA and which are in turn taken from the FIE. As such, the actual college fencing is exactly the same as what you would expect from fencing anywhere else, with two major exceptions. One, nearly all tournaments are based primarily, if not entirely, on five touch bouts. And two, in most tournaments, each team is allowed one 30-second timeout per bout, which sounds like a joke, but it's not. A timeout is initiated by having a coach or an athlete uh, either say the words timeout or signal timeout to the referee and then that person or both both teams get to send their coach or an athlete over to that fencer for 30 seconds and the timeout ends either at the end of those 30 seconds or when the team that called the timeout decides that they're done so at that point the timeout is over and you go back to fencing like normal what will often happen in the format of a college bout is someone will get down 2-0 or 3-0, call a timeout, take a 30 second break, switch their strategy, bring it back to like 2-2 or 3-3, then the other team will call a timeout and then someone usually wins the bout from there. But that kind of thing happens quite a lot. So um, before we get into the actual format, it's important to understand that the logic behind nearly all the NCAA rule and format deviations is based on the fact that the NCAA doesn't want to create a format where a team will be able to win everything based on recruiting just one or two really strong athletes. Instead, they've tried to design a format that forces teams to be much more well-rounded. As such, the relay format that's used at World Cups is not sufficient here because one very good fencer can have a much larger impact on the event. Even if your teammates put in a ton of work, that one really good guy could still come back and win the whole event for your team, which is something that the NCAA really doesn't want to happen. So for head-to-head -head matches, colleges use what's called the dual meet format. So here each team selects three fencers per weapon and they each fence everyone else on the other team in every combination. But instead of going to increments of five, each each encounter, if you want to call it that, is just a five touch bout. And so each weapon has a total of nine bouts. Three times three is nine for foil. Three times three is nine for saber. Three times three is nine for epee. All those added together, you get 27. So the first team to get to 14 wins, wins the dual meet. So there's no way for there to be a tie, and so indicator and touch scored is not considered at all. It's purely a matter of who wins the most matches. Another tournament you've probably seen someone post about at some point is the Ivy League Championships. This tournament is also a dual meet format where each school in the Ivy League with a fencing team fences against each other school in the Ivy League with a fencing team. For the individual championships, a record is kept for each of the competitors, and the competitor who has competed in at least 12 matches with the highest victory percentage wins. With any tie broken by indicator and then touch a score the same way that you would do at a World Cup or a NAC. The team victory is given to the team with the most team victories, which sounds logical, but in practice that doesn't actually make much sense. And I'm gonna present a screenshot to you now of the Ivy League championships from this year and there is a small problem with it again in my opinion take a look at it and see if you can spot what that problem is <laughs> hopefully you've noticed by now that there's more than one winner in both of the gendered events in fact there's three winners in each of them and so 
it's very common for there to be two or even three winners. In men's this year, there were three winners and only five com like teams competing, which is kind of silly. And that's actually not a bug, it's a feature. that was designed to be this way. Seriously, more champions mean that more coaches get bonuses, and because the entirety of the team gets a ring whenever a team wins Ivy League championships, there are more win ring orders if there are more winners. <laughs> This also means that uh, there's a happier graduating body who will hopefully stay more connected to the school, which means more alumni donations. So more money moves around and everyone is happier for having more team victories. As such, and I'm probably going to get a lot of hate from a lot of people for saying this, if you won the team event but you didn't win outright, in my opinion, you're only an Ivy League co-champion. Sorry, guys. I can actually show you what the ring looks like because I got one the year that I was working for Harvard uh, when the team won outright in the 2019-2020 season, and they're, they are pretty nice to be fair. The other major college tournament every year is college national championships. People also refer to this as college nationals, college championships, NCAAs, or just nationals. In this video, I will be referring to the, this tournament as just NCAAs from now on. The format of the tournament itself is a round robin with 24 competitors. Every person fences every other person to five touches, but only four competitors per weapon, per gender, make it to the final four to fence direct eliminations. The format is absolutely brutal. It is non-stop, High intensity, rapid fire, five touch bouts for two days straight. Every single touch counts qu quite a lot because fairly often ties to get into the top four are broken by indicator. And winning NCAAs four times is one of the most prestigious honors in American fencing. I could only find records of two fencers having actually achieved this before. Those two fencers are Lee Kiefer, hi Lee, and Michael Lofton, who is now known as Mikhail Sankofa. I'm fairly certain there is another one, but I couldn't find him or her, so if somebody else has achieved this remarkable feat but I missed that, please leave it as a comment. The other cool thing that I think is worth mentioning as far as individual champions go is Felicia Zimmerman won back-to-back -back years in different weapons in individual. So in 1998, she won in foil, and then in 1999, she won in epee, which is pretty cool. The only other instance of anybody I found even doing close to that was Nick Chinman winning foil in 2009, where he actually beat Miles Canley Watson and Garrick Meinhardt, maybe you've heard of them, and then the next year he got third place in epee. <laughs> which is also really impressive. But if there's any other multi-weapon champions that I'm not aware of, please, again, leave it in the comments. I've cataloged a lot of modern NCAA championship final and final four matches, but there's still a lot of video missing. So if you recorded a semifinal or a final that's not up on my YouTube play page, please send me a message on Instagram or just, again, leave me a comment here that you have that footage. I'd really like to see it, and I'm sure a lot of other people would like to as well, because some really prestigious names have won this competition. Names you probably weren't even aware of were, at one point, really good fencers. I'm going to leave a link to all of that, again, in the video description, so I highly recommend you take a few minutes to check that out after I'm done talking. So, um... Now that that tangent is over, back to NCAA stuff. <laughs> Winning the, uh... Individual championship is pretty straightforward. You win one. Of, you are one of the top four pool winners. You win two semifinals. Oh, sorry, you win the semifinal. You win the final. You won the event. The team championship is equally straightforward. Each bout won by each fencer is added to the school's total wins, and then the team with the most wins at the end of the four days two for men, two for women, depending on the year. That order can flip, but. Two days of one gender, two days of the other, and then at the end of that, all of the matches are totaled up, and an overall champion is is crowned and awarded. So, I don't actually know what would happen in the event of a tie by matches. I've actually never seen that happen before. But in the history of the program, which has gone back to the early 1900s, 
there's never one single time been two people winning, so they must have some procedure in the event of a tie. Though it seems kind of harsh to have it come down to indicator at that point, but I, I really don't know. So if somebody knows that, please leave it in the format, uh, the, the comments as well. Each team is only allowed to send a maximum of two fencers per weapon per gender to NCAAs. So the most that a team can send is 12 fencers. And this year, only Harvard and Notre Dame qualified all 12 people. So unless something crazy happens, one of those teams is almost certain to be the winner. Because I think since the inception of the program, only, only one or two times has somebody won when they didn't send the maximum number of people there. Based on my initial quick look at the qualifiers, I'm pretty sure this year my money is going to be on Notre Dame to win the championship. Sorry, Harvard. So the really complicated part of the whole process is regional qualification. This tournament is brutally unforgiving. The number of people who can qualify per weapon and the number of people who compete for each region are slightly different, but essentially the format here is based on multiple rounds of pools with a pretty big cut between each round. So regionals ends with a giant pool, usually a pool of 12, and each previous pool is shrunk by about 30 percent so i'm just going to talk about the men's saber because again that's the the weapon that i know best but in the northeast region for example the um there was a play in round where there were a couple of people who were lower ranks coming into the tournament that had defense for the the top 35 then those 35 people were broken into pools of seven so five pools of seven then those five pools of seven were dropped down to three pools of seven. Then those 21 people were put into a pool of 12. So there's a, like I said, there's a pretty harsh cut each round. And then at the end of that process, the place that you end up based on your victories that day in the final pool and your ranking over the season based on a crazy complicated strength seed called your power rating is averaged together and based on that average you get the placement of your finishers and then for the qualifiers they literally just take the top x of that one i think the northeast region gets eight qualifiers maybe it's 10 that number changes slightly every year and it's different for weapons as well so it's difficult for me to keep track of all that stuff but since only two people can go from each school, if somebody like Notre Dame qualified three people within that number, they would skip one of those people and just bring that number down to the next person. So anybody who is not already being sent from a school with two people will just continue to go down that list until they just run out of qualifying spots. So the regional formats are all pretty similar. In the Mid-Atlantic region, it was, again, a very similar format, but they only started with 40 people, so they did a play-in round to 30, where they had five pools of six, and then they did um, five pool, uh, three pools of six, and then they did one final pool of 12. In the Western region, I think they just started with a pool of 13, because only 13 men's saber fences were in the tournament, and in the Midwest, there was... Uh, I think only 18 people competing, so there was three pools of six and one pool of 12. But the the idea is you consecutively whittle down the field so you get this one giant pool and then that pool, which simulates the actual NCAA final tournament, is what determines who gets to go average with your strength factor. So the other thing I want to say about NCAAs is the atmosphere there is insane. I can't possibly make you understand that in any realistic way unless you've actually been in the room and felt the energy there but usually the entirety of each team is present to cheer for the people who are fencing so the energy is incredibly high and the pressure on the athletes is enormous i very much like this aspect of the tournament because the energy is unlike any energy that you will experience in any other competition in the world, literally. Uh, what I don't like about this is the method by which the outright winner is determined. As I said before, 
only Notre Dame and Harvard qualified 12 people. So the outright championship is basically just, like I said, unless a miracle happens, between the two of them. So going into this competition, only two schools have any chance of actually realistically winning. So that's a bit strange. And since men's and women's results are added together, and it's impossible for any school that doesn't send the maximum to win the tournament, no schools that have only a men's team or only a women's team can ever stand any realistic chance of actually winning. And that didn't used to be the case. There used to be a men's champion and a women's champion and an all-around champion at various points, but at some point, for a reason I don't really understand, they got rid of the men's and the women's event and just made it an outright winner. For some schools, it's not even possible for them to have both teams because of something that's called Title IX, which is a college rule that says that a university has to have the same number of men's and women's programs, which makes sense, but in practice, because there are some teams like football, which very rarely have, well, I mean, maybe not very rarely, but don't always in equal numbers have a men's and a women's program, there are certain programs like fencing, which aren't allowed to have a men's team. So it's a little strange that this format completely, like, just nullifies their chance by default. It's a little strange to me. So I would really like to see them return to a format where there's a men's team champion, a women's team champion, and an overall team champion. I think that would be really cool. It would make it more competitive for more people if we want to go with the Ivy League format of more people win. But in an actual way that makes sense, I think... It would make more people happy. It would make it more competitive for more people. It would just be an all-around better experience, in my humble opinion. Uh, but that's it. I think that's everything. So that's everything I can think of about American College Fencing anyway. So if I missed anything or got anything wrong, please leave a comment, and I'll answer you as soon as I can. And uh, I'll see you next time. Bye, guys. And last but not least, I'd like to thank my Emerald and Platinum patrons, David Amrani, Jonah Atkinson, Tiffany Miller, and Veronica Saran for their very generous contributions to this channel. Any other names you see are gold patrons. Thank you guys so much for the contributions. They really help out a lot and will enable me to make more videos like this. If you have any more ideas for what you want to see next, you can vote on those things on my Patreon page. To help support the channel, you can find links to my Patreon, PayPal, and Venmo accounts in the video information. Thanks, guys. See you next time.